Naples University. So our campus is located on the traditional lands of the Kosepsum and the Lekwungen ancestors and families who've lived here for thousands of years. And we're really grateful to be able to do the work that we do on these lands. And I know that many of us are working from home from different locations. So just wanna take this moment to all um, have a little gratitude for the lands that we are on wherever we're joining from today. So today is the first um, session in our Building Back Better series that is spearheaded by the School of Environment and Sustainability at Royal Roads. Um, so today we're going to be diving into climate change tipping points and I'm very, very excited to be joined by some amazing guests today. So my name is Christy Jones and I'm an education advisor at the university, but I'm thrilled to be passing off um, the baton for the rest of the webinar to Dr. Thomas Homer Dixon, Dr. Leslie King and Dr. Chris Ling. So I'm actually going to pass it over to Leslie at this time to introduce the topic a little bit more and then hand it off to Dr. Dixon. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this inaugural session of the School of Environment and Sustainability's webinar series, Building Back Better. Some of you may know that I'm a little skeptical about that title. Um, and about the slogan, uh, the building back tends to imply going back to the way we were before the pandemic. Um, better is okay, implying at least incremental improvement, whereas some people think we need to be um, promoting transformative change. Anyway, you're welcome to this first webinar. The next one is called the Biodiversity, Climate Change and Human Health Nexus. And that's in June and you'll be getting lots of uh, uh, reminders of that. Um, so today we're talking about uh, climate tipping points. Uh, and as you may know, these climate tipping points are adding up to indicate a planetary emergency. Um, and we decided today that we didn't really want to talk about all the horrors of those tipping points, although scientists have generally agreed that uh, we're experiencing nine uh, potential tipping points right now, mostly to do, I love the slide, um, with sea ice, loss of sea ice, uh, uh, um, <laughs> the Greenland ice sheet, the Antarctica ice sheets, etc., as well as forest permafrost, and uh, probably most troubling, the disruption of ocean circulation. Um, however, today we also want to talk about social uh, tipping points that are more positive, uh, tipping points that we could use to tip society back to a more sustainable trajectory. Um, and so I'm going to introduce to you the person who knows probably more about this than anyone. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Thomas Tad Homer Dixon, who was born in Victoria. He's a hometown boy and we're delighted to have him back. Um, he's here to create and run the Cascade Institute at Royal Roads University. And this institute is addressing uh, humanity's converging crises and challenges, environmental, social, political, um, philosophical, technological, and health, as well as others, including biodiversity. They're using advanced methods and tools to map and model complex global systems. They're also identifying uh, intervention points or leverage points um, through which we can shift humanity's trajectory uh, to a more sustainable and prosperous future. Tad has a BA from Carleton and a PhD from MIT. He's also the university research chair at Waterloo in the Faculty of Environment. He's the founding director of Waterloo's Institute for uh, Complexity and Innovation. Uh, he was the director of the Trudeau Center for uh, Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Toronto. He's the author of four books, Christy, 
among others, the author of many, many things. Um, but his most recent book, which you can see there, Commanding Hope, published in 2020, is a wonderful, inspiring book, and I urge you all to read it. I know you'll enjoy it. Um, but as well as his scholarly writing, he writes a lot for popular, wider audiences, New York Times, Financial Times, uh, Scientific American, and the Toronto Globe and Mail. His writing's inspiring uh, and very influential, and uh, I believe uh, goes a long way to promoting these social tipping points and changing the world views that we need to change in order to um, fulfill the promise of those positive tipping points. Okay, over to you, Tad. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was a really wonderful introduction. And hello, everyone uh, from uh, Royal Roads University. And uh, uh, I have a lot of ground to cover uh, today. Uh, this is sort of going to be complex systems theory 101 in 15 minutes. Uh, so let's get going. Buckle up your seatbelts and hold on. I, I, I want to just say one thing, though, at, at the beginning. Uh, we did agree among ourselves that uh, we would try to downplay the, the horrible aspects of this challenge that we're facing with climate change. But I decided as I was thinking about this that we really need to get some basic problems on the table with respect to climate change and especially the tipping point implications. But keep in mind as I'm going through that all of the phenomena, tipping point phenomena and concepts that I'm talking about are also directly applicable to human systems. And, and uh, to the extent that it looks really bad that the climate might be approaching some tipping points that could be terrible for humanity, we also seem to be approaching some social tipping points that could be very positive for humanity and allow us to move forward uh, very rapidly on the issue of climate change. So keep that in the back of your mind because that's going to be the focus of our conversation after my presentation. So I'm going to share my screen now and bring up my slides. Now at this point you should have the opening slide and uh, maybe I could just have a confirmation that it's actually visible. Yep, it looks great. Great, okay. So again, complex systems theory and basic concepts relating to tipping points in uh, 12 to 15 minutes, here we go. Uh, complexity, the basic story. I'm a complexity guy. I've been working on complex systems. Uh, I, I, I don't, by the way, think I am uh, you know, the leading spokesman for this perspective. Uh, um, by any means, there are enormous numbers of researchers around the world who are doing this, but I have been working on complex si system science for uh, about uh, uh, three decades now, and applying the, the concepts of complexity to uh, a variety of challenges that humanity faces. And the basic argument of people who are working in this area, in this uh, domain of science, is that we need to shift from seeing the world as composed mainly of simple machines to seeing it as increasingly composed of complex systems. Simple machines can be taken apart, they can be analyzed and fully understood. Uh, think of something like a, a, a mantelpiece clock, I'll show you a picture in a moment. They are ultimately no more than the sum of their parts. And critically, simple machines uh, show proportionality of cause and effect. So small causes produce small effects and big causes produce big effects. This is what we mean by linearity, causal linearity. They exhibit normal or equilibrium patterns of behavior. And we, it means something to say that they exhibit normal behavior. And because of all of these first three points, simple machines generally can be managed because their behavior is predictable and we understand them. So you think of, a, of, a, of something like this mantelpiece clock, which we can take apart, and analyze in its pieces, its bushing, its cog wheels, its springs, et cetera. We can put them all back together. And uh, if, if uh, it's not working properly, we can usually attribute the problem to a single part that's bent or broken or out of place or something like that. And, uh, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's ultimately reducible to its parts. And we understand it very well. So its behavior is predictable. If you wind it a small amount, it runs for a short period of time. If you wind it larger, a, long, a larger amount, it runs for longer. So that's the kind of proportionality of cause and effect that we're talking about. Now, complex systems 
are more than the sum of their parts. They have what philosophers call emergent properties. You put all the pieces together and they start to do things that perhaps you haven't anticipated or that can't be predicted by just looking at the parts. It's almost like you put all the pieces together in the clock and it spreads some legs and a couple of eyes and a mouth and it says, uh, hi, I'm out of here and walks out of the door. It, 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 you know, it's something happens that you haven't anticipated before and it's completely, it's something that you would never have expected. Complex systems show disproportionality of cause and effect. So their behavior is often nonlinear. Sometimes small things cause big changes and big things don't cause much change at all. And they can flip from one pattern of behavior to another. And that's really what we're talking about today. That's the, the tipping point concept we've talked about or we're, we're discussing. They have multiple equilibriums, multiple stable states. And for all of these reasons, they can't be easily managed because their behavior is uh, often unpredictable. Uh, and we can't, they're opaque in their behavior. So we can't see inside and uh, reduce them ultimately to just their parts and how the parts work together. So complex systems include purely physical systems such as uh, 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 Earth's uh, atmospheric system, uh, and a big component of the Earth's climate system, but they also include living systems. This is what complex systems theorists often call complex adaptive systems. Coral reefs, uh, forests, soil biota are all examples of complex systems. And then they include, of course, human systems, which we in our work call complex representational adaptive systems. Uh, these are systems where, uh, where uh, symbolic representations of human beings play a very important role. And they have a whole layer of complexity in addition to the kind of complexity you see in physical systems like the atmosphere or uh, natural and biological systems like a coral reef or a forest. So I'm gonna talk quickly about four concepts that are really at the core of much of our conversation about climate change tipping points. The first is nonlinearity, and then feedbacks, and then critical transitions and hysteresis. And I am going to uh, unpack some of the enormous challenges we face with respect to the climate right now, starting first with the issue of nonlinearity. So we need to have a good sense of where we're going if we continue along our current trajectory. And here's a graph of the temperature of the Earth going back to 11,300 years before the present. So it's the surface temperature of the planet, of the troposphere. You can see that it has varied during that period of time around 0.7 degrees Celsius. In the last 2000 years, when modern human civilization developed, it's varied around 0.5 degrees Celsius. And we are already significantly outside that envelope of temperatures. And we're heading to a place that is radically outside that envelope of temperatures if we continue with the emissions that, we're under, that are underway right now. This is a really good example of a nonlinear response of a system because it's a result of a change, a relatively small change in atmospheric composition. Basically, we've gone from uh, a composition or a, 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 an amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of about one part in 4,000 to an amount of about one part in 2,000. And we've already produced, uh, produced enormous warming uh, as, to, as a result of what seems to be a relatively small change in atmospheric composition of carbon dioxide. So we are, as Stefan Ramsdorf, a German, uh, a renowned German uh, climate scientist says, we are on a trajectory that we're catapulting ourselves way out of the Holocene epoch, the, the period of time since the end of the last ice age, 11,500 or so years ago, up to the present. Uh, and if humanity stays on its current trajectory, uh, we will not recognize Earth by the end of this century. To me, and I think to all of you and all of us, this is an unacceptable trajectory. We just have to do what we can to stop this from happening. So part of what happens when, when you have a nonlinear system is that you have, you have a system that can have multiple equilibria. And th these can be represented by uh, a landscape uh, with basins, what are called basins of attraction. You can think of a ball on this landscape as rolling down into one of these basins. And then it's difficult to get it out of that basin. It has to be hit fairly hard to flip from one place to another. But the landscape in complex systems terms can have a lot of these different equilibria. And you don't really know where they are and what the possible transition points are or transition pathways are between one basin of attraction and another. So you have these equilibria with a ball. You think of it metaphorically, a ball at the bottom of, the, of, the, of a basin. 
And if you hit the ball hard enough, it can potentially pop up to up to the, uh, the ridge and, uh, and over, over the ridge into another basin. That would be a shift from one equilibrium to another. And there are really two kinds of things that lift to lead to that kind of shift. shift. Uh, the basin can become shallower over time because the system is becoming less stable and less resilient. And then you can have a, a, a approximate shock of some kind that causes the ball, ball to move from one basin into another. So that's, you have these long-term changes that make the system more vulnerable to a shift from one state to another. And then you can have these short-term shocks that actually push the system in the short term across that intervening ridge into another basin. So that's the basic idea of nonlinearities. Let's talk about feedbacks. Feedbacks are cycles of causes where a change in the system produces a series of other changes that, go, that cycles around to influence the original change, either by reinforcing it or by canceling it out. If it reinforces it, it's called a positive feedback. If it cancels it out or counteracts it, it's called a negative feedback. The thing that most climate scientists are very worried about in the world today is positive feedbacks, these destabilizing. These are situations where, for instance, carbon dioxide released into the environment, into the atmosphere can cause warming that encourages more carbon dioxide to be released. These are the, these are the very scary possibilities of runaway climate change that you've probably heard about. And unfortunately, it seems like we're starting to see some of these phenomena develop in, in, the, uh, in the climate system. <clears throat> and one of the big ones that we're focusing on within the Cascade Institute is uh, the possibility of large carbon releases from the Arctic as it warms up, as the permafrost thaws, that then uh, can, of course, reinforce warming and cause yet more warming of the Arctic and more thawing permafrost and more carbon releases. So that's a positive feedback that could be very dangerous for humankind. Uh, most recent research suggests that uh, this positive feedback is all start, already starting to, to uh, uh, develop. And within the Cascade Institute, we are investigating with a group of researchers how these processes might be slowed or even reversed through various kinds of interventions. Uh, but we're looking at potentially already somewhere between 0 0.3 and 0 0.6 petagrams of carbon per year. That's basically billion tons of carbon per year already entering the atmosphere from warming permafrost. Let's talk about critical transitions. When you get a lot of these feedbacks and nonlinearities in a, in a complex system, you have the possibility of the whole system reorganizing itself in ways that, again, can't be really easily anticipated in, in advance. And this is what we would call a critical transition. And the concern on the climate side is that some of these tipping points, such as what we're seeing in the Arctic, could actually start connecting together. And they could be in a sense, cascades of tipping points that are linking together so that the, so the whole bunch of things start to happen around the world simultaneously that are basically out of control. So the clearest emergency, according to the uh, researchers in that article I just showed you, would be if, there were, if we approached a global cascade of tipping points that led to a new, less habitable, habitable hothouse climate state. We argue that cascading effects might be common and examples are starting to be observed. And here's, here are the tipping points that they identify around the world and some of the possible, what they would call teleconnections or links between them. So you can see at the top, you have changes in the Arctic, uh, Arctic sea ice, melting sea ice, contributing to permafrost thawing uh, that I just talked about a moment ago. But you also have these changes in the Arctic leading to changes in the circulation in the Atlantic and, all, and linking all the way down to what's happening in the West Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, Leslie just referred to some of these teleconnections and possible linkages in the future. So this is really, really bad news. And whatever we can do to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen uh, is enormously important. It's an urgent task. The evidence from tipping points alone, these authors say, suggests that we are already in a state of planetary emergency. So the fourth concept, hysteresis. And this is something that I think most policymakers really don't understand. And basically, it's a kind of irreversibility in the system. It's the idea that even if, if you go across one of these thresholds or critical transitions and the system reorganizes itself, you're not going to get back to where you were along the same pathway that brought you to this new state. So there's a kind of basic reversibility. Here's a graph of potential hysteresis in 
shifts in the uh, North Atlantic thermal haline circulation, which is basically the Gulf Stream in the North Atlantic. Now, this is, this is suggested, but we haven't seen this yet. But the idea is that if we, if we increase the freshwater input uh, across the bottom, you see there from Greenland melting uh, fresh melting ice in Greenland pumps a lot more fresh water into the North Atlantic, that if you reach a tipping point and the the circulation, uh, the Gulf Stream circulation collapses or reorganizes itself. Even if you reduce that freshwater input a lot after the collapse happens, you're not going to be able to easily get back to the state you were in before. And that's what is meant by hysteresis, which means that we need to really prevent the climate from going through these tipping points. It's very important because once we do, we're probably not going to get back to where we were. So we need to reach, as Will Steffen is a, a, a systems theorist and, uh, and climate scientist in Australia says, we need to reach a social tipping point before we reach a planetary one. So <clears throat> this is really what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of today. Uh, how, can we, how can we achieve these social tipping points? And within the Cascade Institute, we focus a lot on what's happening in people's minds, their worldviews, their beliefs, their ethical assumptions. That, would, that can actually, in some respects, change quite quickly, and that might motivate the world as a whole to start uh, moving much more quickly on a climate change problem. And just to conclude, a couple of words. We don't really know what the possibilities are out there. If somebody on August 18th, 2018, had said that uh, a, a young girl uh, was going to sit on the steps of the Swedish Parliament building with a sign saying, school strike for climate, and that she was going to galvanize a global movement of tens, if not hundreds of millions of people to demand more immediate action on climate change, we would have said that's a ridiculous idea. It's impossible for one person to achieve that kind of change. And, we, and yet we know that Greta Thunberg did do that and has done that. And it's one of the reasons that we're seeing much more attention to climate change issues around the world now than we did before she started her act actions. So individual people can make a huge difference in complex systems. They can leverage nonlinearity and they can actually produce tipping points. And certainly collectively together, I have no doubt that we can prevent the kind of terrible outcomes that climate scientists say are, are approaching if we don't make some profound changes. So that is my presentation. And I think I got it almost within 15 minutes. So over back to you, Leslie. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. And still muted. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ted. That was a great introduction to what we're going to talk about. And I've seen some of your questions that came in, and they're absolutely wonderful and totally relevant to what we wanted to talk about today. Uh, Chris, how would you like to? How would I like to what? <laughs> to comment. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I had a big screen across everyone's face, so I, I couldn't see anything. <laughs> it's yeah, I, I, um, I mean, um, I think the, 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 the thing that I think we, we really want to stress with all this is um, it's, it's all, you know, we can dwell too much. And this, this is something that was raised in the questions that we that were submitted before as well. We can dwell too much on the, the sort of the horrible news uh, represented by the science, which of course is real and significant and we, we, we shouldn't forget about it. Um, but really what we, what we would like to try and stress in this webinar is the importance of, of thinking about the positive social tipping points that we can um, hopefully identify and enhance and support that are going to uh, counteract um, those potential uh, environmental threats. Um, and uh, Tad spoke a little bit about the um, uh, the influence of Greta Thunberg, and and you know another one that uh, I know uh, the three of us have, have mentioned previously is um, you know the few thousand people that made the difference in the outcome of the American uh, presidential election just recently, uh, where you had um, you know a major shift. I mean, you you can you can argue about whether it how much difference it's actually going to make, of course, but you had a major shift from an administration that that actively um, 
uh, worked against any efforts globally and uh, nationally to make a difference with climate change to administration that at least uh, so far has, has made a lot of the right uh, noises as the as, as he pointed a lot of people into important places that take climate change seriously. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's not a, you know, the fundamentals of American society have not changed in the last year or two, but just those few thousand people have made that a possibility. And um, I think this is, this is an opportunity, you know, right now we have a, a, an, an opportunity globally where you have um, many significant governments aligned with doing something for climate change that perhaps we haven't had um, in the past. Um, it's looking like the, for example, in, in Germany, you, which of course has taken climate change very seriously for a number of years, they're now the, the, the country with the, um, their energy system is, is the most reliant on renewable energy of, of any country in the world. I think it's, it's roughly sort of somewhere between 12, 15 percent of their en current energy um, is generated by renewable electricity, um, which of course is one of the big trends um, that is occurring in the, in a lot of uh, uh, particularly, um, but not only Western countries. Um, you know, the next president may be from the from the Green Party. Um, that, that's uh, the Chancellor, rather. So that that's a that's a distinct possibility. Um, so there's definite um, signs uh, at the top in political. Uh, views of, of political change um, that, that will serve us well. But I think over the last couple of decades, the most significant work that we've seen um, in terms of responding to climate change challenges has been at the city level. The, um, you know, there's various networks internationally of, of cities that have been, you know, ignoring essentially the um, uh, the lack of leadership from national governments and have really done an awful lot of uh, things to um, uh, try and instigate uh, positive responses in, in the face of climate change in, in the urban fabric with things like uh, changes to building codes, uh, urban planning solutions that, that are um, uh, supportive of alternative transportation. Um, you know, we're now seeing um, a lot of cities around the world looking at nature-based solutions to a lot of um, of challenges related to climate change and the other the other big global issue of uh, biodiversity. So, um, you know, I think I think there's 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 signs of to be hopeful and positive uh, more so now than I think there has been for for, for many years. Of course, the um, um, there's still a lot of work to be done, and uh, uh, but I think that the, the trends are moving in the right direction now. Good. Thank you. One of the things we wanted to do is ask you what your sources of hope are for social tipping points. Um, and I think first, maybe we should ask Tad what his view is of social tipping point potential. Sure, Leslie. Um, despite, uh, you know, my intimate familiarity and knowledge of the climate science, which, you know, for, as, as I think many of us are very close to the climate science, and I've been working on it for over three decades, I don't think the situation is too late. Okay, I have I have two children who are still relatively young, a daughter of 13 and a son of 16, and uh, I, it's just it's just not an option to say it's too late. It, and 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 also one of the things about complex systems, and this is something I tried to communicate, is that they're really opaque. And that uncertainty about the way they operate means that there are probably a large number of possibilities for changing their behavior radically that you can't see effectively. They are in what complex system science call, scientists call the adjacent possible. The, the area of possibility that's just beyond reality. And that if we're clever and we can, in, and we're creative and work together, we might be able to pull those possibilities from the adjacent possibility into reality. That's exactly what Greta Thunberg did. And, uh, and I, have, um, I, I also have worked on uh, attitudinal change, normative change, changes in people, what goes on in people's heads, enough over the last decades to know that that kind of shift can happen in large groups of people very fast. And I think we're starting to see that around the world now. Now, I think we, what part of what I was, what I'm trying to do by communicating, communicating uh, what I did in my presentation is that hope needs to be honest. 
it needs to be grounded in a very clear understanding of the magnitude of the risk and the challenge that we face. Whether it's the personal level and you've got a serious illness, we need to understand uh, the best science relating to that illness and what the, what the risks and probabilities are. And you ground your hope in that. And at the global level, we need to understand just how serious this climate change problem is. Our policymakers need to understand hysteresis, for example. It, it doesn't make sense to push these systems to the limit when you don't know where the cliff edges are. So, so that's what I would call honest hope. Hope that is that appreciates the gravity of our situation, that appreciates that we are unfortunately going to lose a lot when it comes to uh, parts of our ecosystems and things because of the warming that's already in place. But there's all and, and is, is going to come along because of carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere. But there's every possibility that we can still build a world for the 21st century and 22nd century and beyond that is humane and just and is one that allows nature to flourish more generally. That possibility still exists in large part because we live in a nonlinear, a nonlinear world. We are surrounded by complex systems that give us the possibility for leveraging small events into very big events. Thank you, Tad. So I don't like to ask people questions that I haven't thought about myself. So I did think about what were my sources of hope for societal transformation and for the tipping points that might help nudge society to that place. Uh, Chris has already talked about at least one of them at the energy transition. Tad talked about young people and the Greta Thunberg uh, phenomenon. And I think about my students, many of whom are here. And one of my greatest hopes for positive tipping points is my students. However, I did have a couple more. And uh, I'll share those and then we can open it up. So I think that an important source of hope for me is Indigenous perspectives. Um, and that those might influence the world through, in Canada, our reconciliation efforts worldwide through the Indigenous uh, rights movement. Um, I think that the Indigenous perspectives of the natural world are an example of the world views that Tad's talking about and about their influence on our world views and the potential for influencing societal norms or the rules of the game. And I know that one of the things that Tad's interested in is institutions. And uh, with Ann Dale, I'm about to work on another project on institutional renewal. Um, and I think also indigenous science and technology. I think this might be the very thin edge of the wedge right now, but I am very hopeful about those perspectives influencing the world. Uh, the second thing that I thought is that uh, people always say uh, our economic system, our um, industrial, military industrial complex are so uh, rigid, we're never going to be able to move them. But we have changed. Society has changed. Individuals have changed. And it's individuals who change those norms. Um, and we've changed in many ways. Uh, Tad talks about South Africa and the overturn of the apartheid system. I also traveled through South Africa and there were many books out called The End of Apartheid and people predicting that it would end in 2050 and then suddenly without any, well, with very little warning, um, we had a whole new society in South Africa. Um, I think um, gay marriage and the whole sexual revolution is an important thing that has changed. I think finally, and I'm going to quote Emily Dickinson here, hope is the thing with feathers. And I agree with that because uh, my hope definitely resides in the beauty, uh, diversity, resilience, although we cannot depend on that, um, 
the shrinking diversity indeed, redundancy, complexity, and resilience of the natural world. And the reason that my hope lies there is because I think we need a revolution in the way we relate to the natural world um, and the way we relate to the catastrophic loss of biodiversity that we're experiencing now and the need for um, addressing both climate change and biodiversity loss and the benefits of, of approaching them both, both together. I think that's about it. I'll stop there, but uh, those are my sources of hope. I see we have several many already in the, uh, in the chat. Um, so I think I'd like to address some of those. Leslie? Yes. I see one in particular I'd like to respond to from uh, Sam Taremwa, if I've got that correct. Yes. Yes. So Sam says, uh, is there any possibility to declare a climate change crisis as an emergency worldwide? And uh, I, I think in some sense that's already been done by institutions such as the United Nations. If you follow the, the, the uh, language and rhetoric of the recent secretaries general, uh, that would be the case. But uh, I, think, I think there is a possibility for a, a, a deeper recognition of, of, among peoples around the world that we are facing a truly unusual situation, something like the hum humankind has never experienced before. And I want to frame this just in terms of something, a, a non-linearity, a tipping point that we've all experienced uh, globally just in the last year and a half. And it's, it's the pandemic, but there was one particular thing about the pandemic that was remarkable. Between March 2020 and, mid, and about the mid-April 2020, in a period of two or three weeks, almost half the people on the planet locked down, changed their behavior. Uh, the concept of social distancing, which then became the concept of physical distancing, which if somebody had asked me what that meant in January 2020, I would have said, Ugh, what's that? But that concept went global within about two weeks and fundamentally affected people's behavior all over the planet. So we know that it's possible to change our behavior and to change people's attitude radically in very short periods of time. And one thing the pandemic has done, and, and directly to Sam's point, uh, is that it has, it, has, it has shown us that we are on, in a situation of shared fate on this planet. That we, that for problems like the coronavirus or climate change, we either solve it collectively or we all suffer collectively. Uh, and we're seeing that with the rapid development of variants around the planet, because if we don't actually get the incidence of the coronavirus infections down around the entire planet, these variants are just going to keep hitting us indefinitely into the future. So, so that's one thing that is very different about our current age, that I, it's, I think there's recognition, deep recognition, in part because of the pandemic, that we are in a situation of shared faith. We are also connected together in a way that we never have been before on the planet, and that's a truism. We've known that now for a couple of decades in terms of information, material connectivities among us around the world. And the final thing that's really different about this, this situation that makes it different from anything, any other time in the past when the human beings have experienced existential crisis, such as the Black Death in the 14th century, uh, is that we actually have a very good scientific understanding of what's happening. Despite the complexity of these systems, Compared to, for instance, the period during the Black Death, we know pretty well what the problem is and what we need to do to solve it. So we have a situation, an increasingly recognized situation of shared fate. We have extraordinary global connectivity that allows us to change our behaviors globally very quickly. And we have this deep scientific understanding of what we need to do and where we need to go. That means the situation today is very different from anything human beings have faced in the past which means that the possibilities for change are unlike anything that we've experienced in the past either. And that for me is a really fundamental source of hope. And it's the recognition of the planetary emergency character of this that I think is most important just to get come back to Sam's question. Yeah, I was interested in Sam's question too, because there's a lot of disagreement uh, among scientists and commentators in general about the declaration of a planetary emergency. And some people feel that that, it, that is what's needed to catalyze what you, Tad, are talking about. Uh, other people find it much too alarmist and scary, 
perhaps leading to despair and uh, dysfunction. And, and maybe anyway. that's maybe that's a risk. On the other hand, frankly, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg has said <laughs> pretty bad, guys. You know, yeah. follow the science. And, and and but she's coupled that with a moral message. It's really important. She basically said to the adults in the world, the parents in particular, you had one job, guys, yeah. one job, and your job was to take care of us and make sure we had a safe future. And you have you can fill in your expletive, made a mess out of things. So <laughs> so. Uh, we're, we're taking over. We just aren't going to stand for this. The, the sense of urgency and emergency in the situation has actually catalyzed youth all over the planet and the, and the adults who want to join them in this, in this movement. So I, 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 I don't, I, I, I think you've got to be honest about the science. You've got to follow the science. You've got to know what the challenge is. And it looks really scary. So let's get going and do something about it. And I, I think agree. Thing... And Rachel, Rachel has suggested if anyone's interested in getting together for Fridays for the Future, uh, Greta's legacy to us all, um, she is a representative. Sorry, Chris. Go ahead. That's that's all right. And I think I think one thing, another thing that the uh, the the pandemic has shown us is the um, the value of um, um, the sort of the, the the government response that that doesn't that can be very supportive and um doesn't necessarily turn out to be an un, un, unnecessary uh role in our lives you know there's a there's a, there's a sort of there's been a strong trend in many uh democracies to sort of try and remove government from you know day-to-day -day, you know sort of systems and operations and leaving it all up to the the free market and the private sector and i think what covid has shown us is is the the danger of that and the potential for governments to actually make some huge important decisions and what what we've seen um in different countries and their responses to to covid is the the countries which were willing to have a strong and quick government response have turned out to have done rather better and I'm hoping that that'll actually provide a trigger for people generally around the world being somewhat less distrustful of initiatives that come from governments. And someone asked a question in the chat a little while ago around, you know, around whether this needs to be a top down or a bottom up um, uh, solution to climate change. And I think the clear answer is it has to be both. And we're seeing both um, in various different ways um, in the COVID response, in that a lot of countries where they didn't. The government didn't step in and have a, 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 a quick response. A lot of people took it upon themselves to start uh, doing those sort of physical distancing processes and things like that. Um, where and and you know, I'm hoping that then that'll now translate into a response to climate change, where you know, I think people are you know on the on most people do see it as a significant problem, but are kind of at a loss of what to do. And I think part of the reason why they've been at a loss of what to do is they haven't seen that that top down element that's that that's necessary. You, you need both. You can't just have a bottom up or a top down approach to solving something as com complex as climate change. There are such wonderful questions and comments in the chat. Christy, when I'm sorry, oh, go I, ahead. I, I go have ahead, another, Jeff. Leslie, but I don't want to keep yeah. jumping in. Another no, no, that I see no, here. Go right ahead. So there this are many is, wonderful ones. <laughs> they are. There are. There's, this is from Judy Halper. How do we overcome the corporate intransigence of transnationals so that are afraid of losing their income and hide behind having to answer only to shareholders? Now, that really cuts to the heart of many issues, I think. And and uh, uh, so um, I think the leverage point here to get to something that Chris was just saying, top down or bottom up, well, there's a kind of a in complex systems terms, there's kind of a co-evolutionary process between what's happening at the bottom and what's happening at the top. And these two things are influencing each other. The top, whether it's political systems and policymakers or financial markets or um, uh, big corporations and the bottom, consumers, citizens, voters, young youth activists, and these things are are co-evolving co together, influencing each other. And one of the one of the places where we think in the Cascade Institute intervention might be very very powerful and work very fast is within financial markets, because financial markets re respond to incentives, and the incentives on investment in carbon-based industries and carbon 
extraction industries are changing incredibly fast right now. And one of the really, really powerful actors within financial markets is pension funds. And that might sound, everybody says pension funds, it's boring, you know. <laughs> But pension funds control 40, 50 trillion dollars of assets in the world. And, uh, and if, if you can reach the 2000 odd uh, key directors and, and pension fund uh, leaders in the world, you potentially have an enormous amount of influence. It's one of the things that we're working on within the, within the Cascade Institute. If you, can, if you can shift pension funds attitudes and pension fund leaders attitudes towards they're getting a sense for their normative and ethical responsibility towards future generations to start shifting those investment funds away from fossil fuel industries towards renewable energy. That's a shift that can happen very, very fast. Now, remember, pension funds have a vested interest in the well being of the economy in the future. If the economy doesn't function in the future effectively because of climate change, then they're not going to be able to. Uh, send their send their money to their beneficiaries, the pensioners who are expecting to get it. And what, in, within Canada, we have to remember that we are all members of a pension fund, the Canadian CPPIB, the Canadian uh, uh, Pension Investment Board, uh, uh, it, it controls around uh, controls around half a trillion dollars of uh, investment funds. And we are all contributing to that as, as employees or, or uh, through, our, through our jobs. Uh, we are all contributing to that investment fund. We all have a role in it. And, and to the extent that we can mobilize pressure to change the direction of the CPPIB, we can uh, potentially have a huge amount of influence on, on its investments with respect to the fossil fuel industry or renewable energy. So that might seem like a very arcane and boring topic, but it turns out that, in, that incentives within financial markets are really important. And one of the key leverage points within financial markets is pension funds. And we're all members of one, key, one of the key world pension funds right now. And collectively, if we make our voices heard, they will listen. So um, my question was to Christy, the chat is so great. Um, will the chat be recorded in the recording? Um, we don't typically uh, send out all the chat just for privacy reasons and things like oh, that. Of but course. if there's any yeah. resources or links shared, then we can definitely send those out in our um, follow up email afterwards. Okay, great, great. I think there's some convergence on in the chat about mobilization about mobilizing opinion, about changing worldviews to mobilize opinion, about changing our relationship to the natural world, about changing our awareness of um, the climate crisis. Uh, somebody asked in the original set of questions that came with the registrations about the role of education. And I don't want to end this discussion but Christy, I wonder if you could bring up the slides about the school. That's our answer to that question. While Christy's doing that, uh, maybe I'd like to respond to a couple of people who've asked questions about urban sustainability, um, particularly, you know, what we're seeing at the community level and the role of municipal governments. And I think that these these are absolutely crucial scales to because the, the 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 majority of well, some of the biggest. Call, uh, releases of climate change are, um, um, are you know, electricity, uh, transportation, um, and a lot of that is, as you know, directly um, uh, linked to how we live in the communities that we live in. And um, so, municipal governments have a huge role. And some of the ways that municipal governments can 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 play, can play a role are in in planning. So, encouraging walkable and more dense communities that people don't need to drive around can have a, a big impact. Also setting uh, building codes. Um, uh, um, you, know, you know, municipalities have the power to, to have local building codes that, are, that go beyond sort of provincial standards, um, you know, to encourage the inclusion of things like um, solar panels and uh, electric uh, 
you know, sort of decentralized electricity generation and, and green roofs and things like that, depending on the scale of the building. Um, and of course, building the infrastructure for things like, uh, you know, public transit, um, bike uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure for electric cars and things like that. So, you know, there's lots of things at the municipal level that can be done um, and, and are being done in, in many cities. Um, uh, the introduction of space for biodiversity, which can have impacts both for climate change as well as biodiversity, is, is, is going to be crucial going forward. And we can't have that space uh, in our cities without sort of strong municipal planning and, and, and uh, um, policy that uh, encourages the, the uh, incorporation of those spaces into our infrastructure. So, yeah, I think a crucial scale of, of both governance um, and also of the way it directly impacts our lives, because some of the things we're talking about on the global scale, are, uh, you know, they're, they're quite abstract to, to us as individuals. They're sort of sometimes hard to get too emotional about. Um, and it's, it's the emotions that drive change. Whereas if you're talking about the, the way our, our, our communities look and, and our, how livable they are, um, you know, most of the solutions that are proposed for climate change and, and, and such like, uh, you know, they're going to make our lives better, regardless of what you feel about climate change. You know, it's uh, more, more, gr more green and, and, and walkable and livable communities benefits us in many, many other ways, not just, the, uh, um, not just in terms of climate change response. And that, that's going to be a large part, I suspect, Leslie, of the, of the next uh, the webinar to, to create a bit of a sort of link there. <laughs> Absolutely. I would like to give uh, the last word to Tad, but if Christy, if you could show the last couple of slides, then we'll pass it back. Yes, absolutely. So we just have a few minutes Thank left you. so we can go through these slides really quickly. Um, again, this conversation was brought to you by the School of Environment and Sustainability. You can check out the blog. You can find us on the website as well and email us if you have any questions. And I'm going to pop a link in the chat box as well to, oh, Manuel has already done it, to our next session. So you can um, sign up for that as well. And we'll send a link in our follow-up email too if you want to find it there. But um, like we saw in the chat box and like Hillary mentioned, education is a really key part of these conversations and continuing to upskill this um, industry that's going to be having more and more jobs come about. So here's just a quick glance at the programs that we offer within the School of Environment and Sustainability. And I'm actually going to pass it back over to Leslie or, and or Chris to do a quick touch on um, the two programs that they are the program heads for, the BA and BSc in Environmental Practice and MA and MSc in Environmental Practice. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Unmute. Sure. Uh, I am unmuted, yep. Um, so yeah, the... Um, Leslie and I run, uh, um, uh, well, three programs, actually. One of them is not on this, this slide, but uh, the two on this it's slide, the, yeah. the, the Bachelors of Environmental Practice and the Masters of Environmental Practice are, um, are fully online um, degree programs. The, the Bachelor of Environmental Practice is a, is a third and fourth year completion undergraduate program. The uh, Masters of Environmental Practice is obviously a graduate program. And they're uh, um, fully online, fully uh, very flexible programs uh, that we have built in partnership with uh, Eco Canada and align with those uh, with Eco Canada's occupational standards for the environmental sector. So they're very much aligned with potential um, employment opportunities in in the sector, which is rapidly growing. And if you go to the Eco Canada website, you can see a lot of information about the uh, the environmental professional um, and jobs. Um, state uh, as it is it's very uh, positive uh, for anybody that wants to pursue a career in, in that area thanks chris <laughs> and uh, i i am particularly excited about this program the graduate certificate in science and policy of climate change um, this is a standalone program of three courses or it can be part of the masters in environmental practice and so you can actually um, uh, focus your master's program on climate change through the Master of Science or Master of Arts in Environmental Practice. Uh, this certificate has just started the first program on the uh, science and impacts of climate change, the first course, sorry. 
uh, has completed and the students are now in the second course on the policy and governance of climate change. And um, I'm teaching the capstone third course on climate solutions, in which hopefully we can discuss some of these issues. And students will, in that course, work with an organization to help them in their approach to climate change and help raise awareness of climate change through placements. Thanks, Christy. Thank you both. And. Um... If you do want to find out any more information about the programs, you're welcome to reach out to us. The top contact there is if you are, have any questions and you'd be applying as a Canadian student, and if you would be applying as an international student, there's the bottom contact information there. And, and Bev, we have one of our amazing um, enrollment advisors on the call here today. I'm wondering, Bev, if you can also pop a link in the chat box to um, the programs we just mentioned, or just to the School of Environment website as a whole and then people can access that there but with that in mind we'll i will leave it the structure. oh just one the second problem. there we go so with just a few moments left of the webinar um perhaps it'd be great if you could each share some final words before we head off today and if we didn't get to your questions um you're welcome to follow up with us afterwards um, and i'm sure we'd be happy to help with those too we probably didn't get to all the questions because they were long. We did not. <laughs> we did not. And I'm sorry to say that they were wonderful questions. I'd like to give the last word to our guest, Tad. Uh, we've only got a minute or two left. Well, just to uh, emphasize and reinforce everything that's been said about the importance of education, there, there's a, a, a of the many, many good questions. There was one from Rachel Lowenberg. How important is it to people's perceptions to discredit thinking of Bjorn Lombard's false alarm rhetoric and other, other folks who are encouraging as, uh, people to, to deny the seriousness of this problem? Well, that's really where education comes in. Uh, this, this challenge is in some, some sense a bit of a ground war. It's, it, it takes place, uh, the response is going to take place as Chris has been emphasizing within our communities, uh, policy changes and changes and practices within our towns and cities. It takes place around the dinner table when you're having conversations with family members and others or in community in community engagement and town hall meetings, uh, in, in uh, meetings with members of parliament during elections. It's important to be informed about the issues, to educate yourself and be informed about the science so that you can respond to the wholly inaccurate and misleading arguments of people like Bjorn Lombard in his book, False Alarm. Uh, and that's something that we can all do. And together, uh, it, uh, it's because we live in a nonlinear world, relatively small groups of people can have enormous influence if we're well informed and act with, uh, with uh, coordination and collaboration, which is really what the programs at RRU are ultimately about making happen. Thank you very much, Tad. And thanks to all of you. You are one of those small groups of people. And uh, good luck with your future endeavors, um, mobilizing yourselves, your families, and your friends. Thank you so much. I think we had a final question here. <laughs> yes, loved the question. Thank you very much. They will get it through the students. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Actually, quite a few uh, politicians have actually done some of our programs at Royal Road. Yeah, that's so, true. Uh... <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. And thank you, Tad, for your wonderful words. Read his book. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, so much. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye now.